All right. So uh, as a brief of who I am, as I uh, as I mentioned, uh, my speciality is musculoskeletal and sports injuries and rehabilitation. Um, basically, I'm a clinician. So my 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 interest is basically uh, based from patient to practice more. Uh, I joined the Prime Physio in 2013. Uh, uh, and I had a long journey of shadowing and mentorship and co-teaching uh, with, uh, with uh, big names uh, and experts. Uh, I, through my role, I had been, I have passed through the uh, certificates that we hosted, uh, whether it's uh, orthopedic manual therapy, dry needling, kinetic control, a mulligan uh, certificate. Uh, in the other uh, track, um, uh, I, <clears throat> Uh, I had a different experience in the clinical practice uh, as a practitioner in the uh, both uh, public and the private sector. Uh, I joined the Gold's Egypt umbrella uh, and uh, um, different uh, platforms in the um, orthopedic and the sports uh, industries. And currently I'm a senior uh, physical therapist in German Medical Corporation. Um, in Prime Physio, you find me mainly in, in those products, sports uh, physiotherapy rehabilitation program and the dynamic coping therapy uh, courses. So what about our session for today? As I told you, I have a special interest in, uh, in meeting um, uh, sports injuries that I meet a shoulder uh, so much. And not only with the sports people, but also with the, as I told you from the German umbrella, uh, we, we used to have the post-operative patients so much of the shoulder cases and um, uh, old uh, subjects uh, and uh, the stiffness and different problems of the shoulder. And myself, I had been a post-operative patient. So that had uh, um, increased my depth in this, uh, in this uh, uh, joint or in this area. So my aim for today is to start to introduce one of my uh, real patients. So to have discussion on how to make this case, um, how, to, how, how we manage this case starting from the assessment framework, starting from the clinical reasoning, how we take the diagnosis that send it to us to start to um, uh, analyze it into a examination framework, assessment and the management, how we will think about that, how to give examples uh, from the assessment point of view and how to reflect this into problem list and into management and to give examples from the holistic management point of view, whether it's hands-on, soft tissue, hands-off, why and how, and that's it for today. Just giving examples from uh, one of my real cases, step-by-step, step, how we dealt with her. So let's get started into the scenario straight away. Right, so my patient of, of today is... Uh, I will read the scenario and give you a few uh, seconds to uh, think about it. So this is my patient. She is a um, 14 year old, a youth athlete. She is a student and professional athlete. Uh, she plays a squat. She is coming with a right shoulder pain. Uh, and she reported that this pain appears in playing the squash in the forehand when she do the swing. When she hit the ball, the pain is so specific. When she hit the ball, and it's so severe that it stopped her from training. That was two weeks ago. Two weeks ago, she couldn't play because of the pain in this specific instant. Okay, so also one of the things that the patient told me about is um, the the pain is, is it's here. It's going up to the forearm. This is how she pointed uh, about it. And from the stuff as asking if there is any previous history, she mentioned that she, she had also in the right side adductor strain injury. Uh, I will come to this slide again, but let me give you an example of the subjective examination and fill it step by step of our examination sheet. So this is uh, our assessment sheet. Uh, here is some personal information about the patient, her profession. She is a student, her age, 14 year old. So this is how we put it. The help request, she is coming for pain. The patient's problem is pain. Chief complained that she couldn't do her uh, tournament or her competition. 
Um, the medication she currently take, uh, uh, the CLAC, that sort of painkiller, uh, the X-ray or MRI, actually the patient was coming with um, musculoskeletal ultrasonography reporting um, tendinopathy, biceps tendinopathy and uh, subdeltoid bursitis. This is what she gave me in hand report wise. This is the patient uh, report of the, uh, the uh, scanning that she came with and the functional limitation that she couldn't do the swing or the hit. As we asked about the pain assessment, because as mentioned in the uh, left side, uh, one of the things that um, the main aim of the examination, starting from the subjective examination or the interview, that I need to know that starting from the interview, this patient is a red flag, decision-making about this patient, this patient is with me or I will refer it. No, I will not even carry on the objective examination. I will not even put my hands on this patient or I will need to refer it straight away. So this is one of the main goal why I talk to the patient, what I want to do with the information I take from her, the decision-making. So as I take information from her, I think, or I reason the pieces of the puzzle to decide this patient is mine or I'm waiting to hear something that, no, I will refer this patient is not mine. So when the patient tell me that the pain is too specific, when she do, or when she does a specific movement. So, okay, so maybe this is a mechanical pain and she is scanned already. And the pain is uh, referred to ultrasonography that this is an overuse. Maybe this sounds as a happy news, but calm down. I don't have to rely on this only. We don't rely on investigations only. So I will carry on my complete assessment, but this is so far. So the pain assessment started from the severity. When I asked her, how much is this pain? She told me it's severe, like eight out of 10, eight out of 10 on the visual analog scale. If zero is no pain, 10 I'm burning, I'm, I'm pouring burning water. So it's eight out of 10, which is severe. So what made this pain less, the, the uh, reducing, the easing factor, it's just when I put local frame, this is what made it any uh, better. When I asked about the 24 hours pattern, is it persistent? She's like, it's position dependent. When specifically she do this problem, however, this pain is irritable because although it's just one single task that uh, produce the pain. However, she, it stopped her from her main function or her main play. So for this patient, this pain is quite irritable. Okay, so this is what we took so far uh, from the current history, from the previous history, uh, from the medical or drug history, and the investigation she came with. As decision-making, by far, I will not consider this patient as a red flag by far. Still, it's uh, like flashlight that might pop in my mind at any time, but by far, I will not consider her, her as, a decision, as a red flag, which means I will carry on the objective examination uh, part of assessment. My clinical impression that uh, this patient has sort of overuse uh, injury. This is my clinical impression. So decision-making this patient is mechanical pain referring to uh, overuse problem. So this is the second part of my examination, which is the objective examination. I, start, I took the interview part, talking to the patient. So I'll start to go man to man, like putting some hands on, start to go more active. When the patient uh, started to do uh, the active range of motion, don't forget to uh, start with the central component, although the patient is coming with um, maybe a parent, um, Frank, problem, tendinopathy, bicep tendinopathy. However, please don't forget to start with the central spine. And let me give you the clinical evidence that the patient was centrally involved. When this patient started to do neck movement, first of all, when the patient was talking to me, she was like poking too much. This will give me the impression that mm, the cervical spine is not a spirit. I will not judge that her, her problem is central, but it will give me the reason to scan it started from her attitude. So, okay, let's start by examining the active range of motion of the cervical spine. The, it was not easy, the active range of extension, okay? When she went to left rotation, the pain is right shoulder. Left cervical rotation was not easy for her, it was painful and restricted. So this gave me a sign. 
Okay, uh, number two, when you started to do shoulder elevation, it was restricted, it was not painful, but restricted. So this is the active range. The passive range was restricted also. Okay, so this is the passive range, the second block of examination. So the repeated movement test is concerned with the cervical. However, the alternative part for the periphery is the resisted active movement. So for the shoulder, I did the resisted active, resisted, uh, resisted shoulder flexion. It was painful and resisted internal rotation was also painful. So this is the findings for my patient. And the neurodynamic tension testing was mm, like not easy, not okay. And finally, the cognitive motor testing, the CMT, the final block of my assessment framework, the test that I chose from my patient, CMT is the cognitive motor testing. I, I do sort of coordination testing with a pinch mark based on the kinetic control concept. So the test I chose for my patient is to try to take the both arm in elevation without losing the shoulder. So she couldn't do that. She couldn't take the both arms in elevation without do th doing this. And this is, by the way, one of the testing. This is not the only one. So this gave me the clue that the cervical spine, the lack of control in the cervical spine is issued, is one of the components that giving a problem to the shoulder. So it's not spread 100%. And there is sort of central problem that leading to this overuse uh, problem. Okay, so this is how I uh, basically sorted my clinical impression, my uh, thinking, my problem list, what might be going on with my patient as source of problem and the cause of problem that leading to the source of uh, my problem. This is so far. Before I go to the problem list that I decided to work on one by one, so let's have a, a look on evidence uh, about the physical examination. Why, why we, we went this way in the physical examination. So uh, this is um, a review, a literature review, which physical uh, examination has to provide clinician with the most value when examining the shoulder. And, and this is, um, we question it so much, why we didn't do like special test, for example, why we do this, why we do that. This is an update of a systematic review with meta-analysis that's high level of, of evidence of individual tests. Uh, and actually the takeaway message that you, you don't, we don't rely on individual testing. That's why we, in, in the previous framework, it's a lot of, of, of hard work. We, we tested a lot of components. We tested central components. We test um, coordination. We test a lot of things. We didn't just test uh, the thing to confirm the finding uh, of the ultrasonography, for example. So your assessment before the management needs to be really holistic. This is the uh, takeaway from this piece of research. So back to my patient, what are the problem lists that we took based on the subjective and objective examination? So to, to take it as a um, more towards the problem list rather than the specific diagnosis. The, spe the diagnosis that apparently my patient is coming with is, okay, uh, bicep tendinopathy, according to the ultrasonography. Uh, we hear diagnosis like um, uh, frozen shoulder, subacromial, um, uh, subacromial, decom um, whatever. We, we hear a lot of, of um, diagnosis. So here, the, the aim of this slide to start to think about the, the problem that we have or the diagnosis or the label that our patient is coming with to start to like analyze it into physical um, examination wise, what could be the problem? Okay, this patient has tendinopathy. So what is the problem still? So I can interpret or reflect it into physical examination and physical therapy treatment options. Okay, so my patient, for example, was having tendinopathy. So what, what does this mean? It does mean that it has pain. So my patient problem is pain. So this is one of the causes of the main problems of shoulder, that pain, simply pain. So what is, is the other uh, sources of my patient problem that referred from cervical spine? Because when she, she moved with the cervical spine, she, she was having pain. 
And this is confirmed. When she had the neurodynamics, there was some pain. Even the pain is here, local and sharp. But when she had neurodynamics, also there was pain in the same side. It does mean that the pain is not only, it's not only tendinopathy. There is some sort of neurogenic involvement that referred from the cervical spine. So here we think about the shoulder that pain could be referred from the cervical spine. Okay, so this is another thing. So other thing could be stiffness. What does frozen shoulder mean? That it means simply stiffness. If I can't move my shoulder in all directions or in three or four plans of movement. So it means I have a stiffness. Okay. So if I have dislocation injury, if I have slap lesion, if I have labrum tear, if I have labrum injury, rotator cuff tear, what does this mean? That I have instability issue. What if I have fall? What if I have whatever? I mean, I have instability. So the other name for dislocation that I have instability problem. So this could be another problem of the shoulder issues. Or overuse like tendinopathy, I use it too much. Or two of the three, like my patient have pain, my patient have referred component from the cervical spine, and my patient has true tendinopathy. So uh, the last one is my Pain could be a problem from the periphery because uh, if I have fracture injury of the wrist or if I have fracture injury for the elbow, by evidence research and the clinical, the shoulder rotator cuff or the shoulder stabilizers will be inhibited sooner or later, which means that if I have any peripheral injury among the upper limb, so this is a will be a problem to the shoulder joint, or this will be a reason that I have to manage the shoulder joint or the shoulder stability. So this is a, a really nice recap or what are the problems or why the causes of um, management of shoulder uh, problems. For my patients, I will take preferred, which is maybe 20% of the problem, Overuse, which could be 70% of the problem, instability and control, because we have the shoulder girdle, of, which is the scapula. It's not disconnected from the glenohumeral, and we will come to it in few uh, seconds. So we have like one, two, three spots and pain, actually. So we have one, two, three, four. So four problems from physical examination point of view. So what we have to do, okay, I have pain, I have lack of control or control problem, I have tendinopathy, I have, uh, what else? I have referred pain from the cervical spine. What I have to do, okay, it is so simple. Let's get to the examination slide. If I have range of motion problem, so I have to do, uh, I, if I have restriction in the range of motion like my patient, I have to do mobilization strategies. <clears throat> range of motion problem, mobilization strategies, as simple. If I have neurodynamic tension testing, positive, so I have to do neural mobility, as simple. If I have cognitive motor testing, positive, I can't control, I have coordination problem, so I will do coordination training, movement training, as simple. So if what type of problem, so I will solve it. How I will solve it? If I have uh, resisted testing positive, like resisted bicep test positive or resisted rotator cuff positive, I have two options. I have soft tissue management, I have tendon loading because I have research for loading the tendon for healing. So this is as simple as that. So to recap those few words, let's think about this Mercedes model and what could be better than the Mercedes model for patient management. What, what does this stand for? It stands for that giving the holistic management. What is the holistic management? As we mentioned, 
mobilization, neurodynamics, soft tissue uh, is an example for the hands-on. So you will agree with me that those sort of hands-on that's related to the patient problem is one of the three sectors in this nice logo. Okay, but before this, we have another sector in this amazing logo called Pain Your Science Education. What does this mean? What's the Pain Your Science Education? This patient coming to be to me with a pain eight out of 10, which is high pain, coming with an injured tissues or overused tissues. And this patient doesn't care to go to play tomorrow. So I have to assure her, I have to make a goal setting. I have to do some sort of education. I have to make her understand what does pain mean. I have to, 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 to let her understand that the fact that no pain, no gain is not, is not uh, correct. That there is, uh, she has to uh, let the body heal. She has to understand that no pain, no gain is not uh, a right thing. Not, not any pain we will follow. Not any pain uh, will stop me. Not any, not, uh, and I don't have to cross my pain limit. So this sort of uh, traffic light system that we will come across is very important to educate your patient. And a very important cue for patient education and patient assurance is building a relationship, especially when it comes to youth. So what's my cue for this? Especially that she is a 14 year old, she is a student, she has a psychosocial factors coming with you, either with her mother, either with her coach. Uh, so first thing is to have one-to-one -one relationship with this patient. This patient has to trust you, has to obey you, has to uh, follow you. So the first of all, your assessment session, uh, make it as much as you can one-to-one -one, without the parent, without the coach. So this is a very important clinical tip. So this is a part, patient education, patient assurance and building relationship with the patient, especially when he is a youth. Last thing is the hands-off. And the hands-off, we will have the big highlight on the exercise compound the different functional components. This patient is doing a lot of cardio. This patient, her pain is so specific. Her pain is specific in a hit. And this means that she needs stability. That's why I re um, reasoned her problem as a lack of control. Uh, stabilizers, inefficiency. That's why in certain moments she reported pain. There are sort of imbalance that need a specific training in her exercise. So if this patient came to me and I gave her the fancy electrotherapy and the fancy shockwave and the very expensive equipment, and I didn't tackle this component of management, this patient will definitely suffer. So to make your, your management really global and complete and avoid recurrence, you have to work on patient trust. You have to work on the very nice hands-on mobilizations of the tissue and whatsoever. And you have to approach their exercise therapy with the right component for the right athlete. So pain cues, empowerment, youth relationship, as we mentioned, and goal setting. Okay, so let's start with the management, what to do straight away with this patient, go with faster pace. Not to forget the shoulder complex is uh, four joints altogether. Four joints is uh, acromioclavicular, glenohumeral, uh, sternoclavicular, and scapulothoracic. So it's four joints altogether. So when the patient has a problem in the glenohumeral, this is the shoulder joint. When we, when we say shoulder problem, we mean the glenohumeral problem. But we still have a big complex to uh, approach. Uh, mechanics wise and uh, pathology wise. So uh, what I want to say was this, I want to say was this, that the first thing I do uh, clinically speaking wise is I make sure that my patient is capable to set a neutral scapular position. Okay, so why I want to set the neutral scapular position because the scapular thoracic position is uh, a very a, a very important joint. This is the shoulder girdle that's uh, responsible for uh, the AC kinematics. This is responsible for the glenohumeral and the humeral head translation. So when my patient come and tell me I need and have a pain here in this position, I need to consider what's going on in this joint 
starting from the scapulothoracic and the glenohumeral stability point of view. So the first thing to check the stabilizers, part of the stabilizers are the segmental stability, the stabilizers around the joint. So the stabilizers are really connected, starting from the scapulothoracic and the glenohumeral. Who are they if we want to go so much in details? So we are thinking about the rotator cuff because they have static stability and the dynamic stability. We have from the scapula, we have input from the serratus anterior, middle and lower traps. Those muscles, when they, uh, uh, they are not efficient, when they are not uh, acting as they should be, the um, malalignment of the scapular position affect the humeral head, affect the clavicle also. So when the patient do any force, uh, I will not be surprised that other tissues like the tendons, like the AC uh, ligaments will be affected. So this is a, a very brief uh, about how the lack of uh, stability or the lack of activity of the stabilizers when they, they uh, don't take on their actions. Other tissues, e either muscles tend to be overactive, either tendons take to be uh, um, overloaded or joints. That's uh, of no surprise to find uh, a head of humerus moving too much, injuring the tendons here uh, or joints. This is the, the really common thing. So that's why when I started to check if the patient is capable to do the neutral scapula, so I'm here checking the capability of the stabilizers doing their job. And in the face-to-face -face learning workshop, we do it clinically, how we can do it, how to know that the patient is, uh, uh, is capable of doing it. And let me tell you uh, about my patient. When I tried to adjust the neutral scapula for her, she started to have crepitations. So crepitations in this case doesn't mean like she has ligamentous instability. Crepitations sometimes mean that this is functional instability, that the segmental instability is the responsibility, as I told you, of stabilizers are not as they should be, are, are not so okay. So that's why the patient is uh, clicking, they, they have crepitation, they, you can hear the sound. Why? Because the movement is loading in the joint straight away. So as I go with the assessment with my patient moving, trying to check the mobility and the harmony of the scapula, simply like as if trying to clap your hand and try to check if the scapula is capable to move along the ribs or along the uh, the inferior angle is capable to go along the ribs. This is a quick scanning technical point. As the patient to start to give repetition and the scapula start to wing and start to go in abnormal harmony, this gives me the cue that this patient's problem, although it's sounded in the tendon or sounded in the joint, but the cause of the problem is this abnormal alignment. And here I know that I have to give input on the stabilizers on particular. Either they are dynamic stabilizers, either they are uh, um, static stabilizers. So what I do here, setting the neutral scapula. So the clue for shoulder actually uh, management is the sideline position. What I do from sideline position, I have a list of technique from the Mercedes model, a lot of techniques actually to do from the sideline. First of all, I started to do the scapular mobilization. So to learn the neutral scapula by the scapular mobilization, because usually the scapula is migrating here or stuck here or stuck up or stuck down, whatever. So firstly, I do the scapular mobilization from sideline uh, to prepare for the motor learning, which is the neutral scapula. I started to do the soft tissue for the neck. You remember the patient to the left was suffering. So I started to ease off the levator scap, the sclenii, the connecting muscle between the shoulder and the neck, also from this position using my cups. Those are the dynamic cups I use, using my strain counter strain, muscle energy technique. I start to release the deltoid, which is one of the mobilizers over active group. I start to release the pectoralis, one of the chain that the patient used because this patient do this movement so much 
So the pectoralis is so um, exposed from this position. Uh, front functional line release the pectoralis, uh, main component of them, and the thoracic rotation because uh, this is one of the uh, component of the uh, spiral line. So when the shoulder is restricted, you will not be surprised that the, the thoracic spine is stuck. So this position gives me option to, to, to take a lot of boxes from the soft tissue management or even the motor learning uh, from uh, the options, the treatment options that my patient needs. So it's um, when it comes to shoulder management, you will need this position. And this is uh, the, the, the list of techniques that when it comes to face-to-face -face learning, we will start by applying this. So uh, back to the scapular neutral and uh, abnormal positions, you can relate. Actually, my patient is a, a nice female, so I couldn't take shots from, uh, from her abnormal scapula, but you can relate from this guy, a shoulder patient also, an athlete also. Uh, when a patient have um, this problem, so you can see how uh, the abnormal scapula pulling too much on the neck, so likewise, my patients, you can, you can relate or imagine if this patient to try to move to the, to the left or to the right, he can have this tension. If he tried to do the neurodynamic tension testing, you can, you can imagine that this uh, abnormal scapula is pulling too much on the mobilizers here, including the levator scap and the brachial plexus. So this tension is not normal. However, when he tried to adjust, like engage, sorry, engage some muscles here. Now it's curved, now it's uh, look kind of normal uh, because there is some sort of engagement here. So the muscles here uh, in the neck level doesn't need to, to be so much tight like the abnormal um, uh, picture here. So uh, the nerves can be uh, easier, the muscles can take its curve. So this is a sort of modification for the better scapula. Uh, and more details in the in the face-to-face -face learning on how to educate the patient, how what's the, the cues, what is the guide you tell him to uh, adjust the scapula, how to know that adjusting the scapula is not just retraction because this is the worst thing you can tell your patient. Okay, so back to the Mercedes model. We agree that soft tissue is definitely part of our work, especially with the athletes. Here are some uh, examples, whether it's cupping, dynamic cupping, you can see that um, my cups is, is so different. It's rubber cups, it's, it's here, it's suction therapy, suction decompression. Uh, and also one point I want to refer to refer that I'm not just taking the, the bicep as involved, I'm, I'm simply taking the deltoid. Um, I'm not focusing on the, the apparent problem. When you move, you can feel the palpation of the referral patterns and the trigger points. Uh, and this patient is doing this, this movement. So she clinched too much by the forearm. And it was not a surprise that when you go through the forearm, you find a big um, uh, area or a big room for trigger points. So that's why you find me taking the whole line. And this is how we deal with the athletes, starting from the release point of view. Or for the exercise point of view, we take the chain, the myofascial chain. So here you find me taking the whole arm line from a myofascial point of view. Uh, so starting from the arm and passing by the forearm, trying to think about the transmission of the force load through the whole arm. And here, that was one of the options that after one of the tournaments, we used the uh, uh, dry needling. And this is very rare situation actually to use with athletes. Uh, so afterwards, she didn't permit me actually to use it. So it was only the one thing. And in this case, I was using for the distal bicep and one for the middle deltoid. In this photo, I was using the taping. And my purpose was just uh, corrective taping. So you, you find me using this. The patient is doing this too much, so I was trying to, to open in this way. So I open and attach my tape and pull. So I pull, I put the tape and I pull and uh, adjust the uh, mechanics. So it's more of corrective taping and the other strap was for the extensors of the forearm. So this is a brief of how I, I do variety of 
uh, my soft tissue options, just giving examples. Uh, so this is the, the release and we agreed that release the mobilizers, deltoid, bicep itself, uh, levator scap, those are the muscles that will suffer as a result of the overactivity. Uh, here, I started to go more towards the cause of the problem, so targeting the uh, stability. In this photo, it was for, an, for, for another guy. Here, I was trying to work on the head uh, in place stability. So after training the patient to put the head in place, actually one of the um, cognitive motor training we used to gather in the session, just put head in place because the patient, one of the main problems that the head is translated either anteriorly or inferiorly. So after putting in place, I try to do sort of static stability through this wall to sustain. So engaging in this way, the rotator cuff. So this is also um, one of the options on training the static um, or working on static stability of the glenohumeral joint. So as to start to go more active, because we know that the tendon, uh, so working on the overuse itself. So we know that uh, the tendon, we will not heal the tendon unless we load it. And this slide illustrates why, because this is the healthy tendon. This is the unhealthy tendon. The healthy tendon is a uh, form of collagen fibers that's um, well uh, bundled and well oriented. Uh, however, the unhealthy tendon is uh, the collagen fibers are disrupted. This is type 1 collagen. This is type 3 collagen. So what makes type 1 a heal to type, uh, type 3, sorry, type 3, the abnormal tendon, go to type 1 so to heal and be like a class A tendon. So the, the uh, proliferation, the, the abnormal collagen bundles need to be remodeled reach the remodeling phase is the loading actually. So in this video, I was giving, trying to load on the bicep oh. in a game therapy. So what I was doing is uh, giving sort of coordination. And I always love to give one, uh, more than one component in the same exercise. So I was giving my patient a coordination, like setting the neutral scapula, Playing with the dumple as a sort of warm up. So let's play it one more time. Setting the scap neutral scapula as we did at first or the previous session. Play with the dumple on both hands. And you can tell that in, in one part there is eccentric loading or loading in lengthening with the bicep. So she, she can't have pain, although we, we load on. Sound is not coming. So uh, am I clear? Sound of video or my sound? No problem, doesn't matter. Uh, I, I, the video is just to show the um, sound is clear. Okay, perfect. No, for the video, it's fine. Yes, okay. For the video, I, I just want to show the movement. It doesn't matter. The video is not important as a sound. Okay. Well, so perfect. Everyone is okay. So, uh, so we give examples of how to set the neutral scapula. And I started by mobilizing the scapula, working on the soft tissue and the cue I give is side lying. I give examples for taping, dry needling, dynamic cupping, whatever, whatever is easy for the patient. And then I started loading the tendon. So trying to reach the healing phase because this is one of the major problem. So not only working on the cause, no working on the tissues itself by loading and the prescribing exercise that a load on the tendon without pain. So this is another option. Okay, so this is another option by loading the uh, um, uh, bicep tendon and you can relieve the muscle action with the prescribed exercise. Uh, and in this exercises, I was uh, following the traffic light system and the 10 repetition max. 
So I, I always, when I give first time exercise, I ask my patient to, to start to do 10 repetition max. So first of all, that presetting point is setting a neutral scapula. And this take a lot of training, like previous set, sessions itself. So setting the neutral scapula and the start to load on the tendon 10 times. How is the pain? In this session, the patient, the pain is seven and her base pain is eight. This is actual results. Okay, go ahead. For me, this is green. For other colleague, okay, no, no, I'm, I fear that, okay, this is not a green. This is yellow. Mm, maybe I would use the load on the pulley system and give another 10 repetition max then to decide the exercise dose. This is how we go. All right, so uh, I start to do 10 repetition max. Her pain is seven. Seven is not good, but the base pain is eight. If after this 10 repetition max, the seven doesn't goes up, doesn't go up, okay. For me, I will go ahead because I need to cross the pain. So that was the case. It was seven, which is mm, still irritating. So for me, it was yellow, but I release. I go for another recovery. I know I go for another exercise and then I go again. So this is how we use the traffic light system. And we start to give loading, even with pain, so to start to cross, uh, to go for healing. So we always modify the, the pain outcome measure and the function outcome measure. There is pain, but, but we, we went through a function and we need to go for this, but we doesn't need to exceed the pain. This is how we go for exercise prescription. For my patient, it was seven, but the pain is changing. So not the main pain. So you, you keep uh, reasoning and the guessing if this will be okay or not. So let's go more functional. Because as I told you, my patient is an athlete. My patient do this, my patient do that. So when you do training, also you need to prepare her for this movements. So I know I need to work on the bicep loading like this. I need to work on the rotator cuff like this, but I don't need to work on them on my own. So first I start so static, so segmental to work the head in place like I did here to make sure that she is capable to move the shoulder from a static position, from right head in place, from uh, fired stabilizers. Like I, I need to make sure that she's capable to produce the movement and the stabilizers are so dominant. She is not doing like this. She is not doing the awkward movement. This I need to make sure of all of that. But later on, this nice setting that we adjusted and the train for need to be engaged into full functional and when we we say functional for an athlete i need to engage the whole chain so this is an example of a spiral line we talk about that in the shoulder exercise design we talk about that in the copying examples of myofascial release because for the athletes this is this topic is crucial because this means the movement the flow of their activity so this is very important to consider in the design of their exercise uh, in this uh, rubber banded training, the patient was uh, walking in lunge. So to start to engage the upper body to the lower body. Uh, and in this way, she is uh, combining two lines together, front functional lines and the spiral lines. I, I will not go so much about that, but this is a way of um, using the game she, she or the, the sports, uh, taking the analysis of the sports lines or tasks into the design of the exercise, starting from the focus of the tissues you want to load on. This is how we design the exercise. So uh, another option here, uh, this is the starting position. She, she started to take that back from here again, starting the scapula neutral position and start to push and here I'm taking length from the middle traps and then I go up to start to take the lower traps and higher and higher. And my main highlight or reasoning for those options as I, um, I, as I point with the arrow, it's here. I need more input from the middle traps, from the lower traps. And as I go higher and higher, I need here the serratus anterior. 
So this is a really good exercise. If the patient is capable of doing it the right way, you hear really engaging the full stabilizers of the shoulder girdle. So this is a really, really good one. Uh, so uh, this is one of the exercises that when the patient is doing, although because it's, it's also related to the patient pain, because pain is here. The patient pain is, is, is here. So I always take the patient a problem coming complaining to me when I hit here the ball and try to take it as an idea for exercise and engage what I want. And from here, I want to take the middle, lower traps and serratus uh, anterior. So this is also exercise options to start to work on uh, rotator cuff and uh, shoulder girdle stabilizers. So uh, this is again a piece of research that's discussing how the motor control exercises. Motor control is either a coordination. So you, you, the patient is capable of dissociate. This is one of example of motor control. Like I move the shoulder without the neck. I, I move the scapula without, without unnecessary humeral head movement. So this is motor control or stability training or stabilizers efficiency, like I'm holding specific uh, um, like uh, stabilizers, uh, like I'm doing with drawing with, with certain pain mark, I'm rowing with efficiency, I'm rowing with dominance of certain stabilizers. So when we talk about the motor control, simply we are either approaching the coordination component or efficiency of certain stabilizers, which is, low pace movement in nature rather than over activity of mobilizers or compensation of mobilizers. This is, this is briefly the motor control. So uh, this research um, discussed the motor control exercises, alignment and coordination that involved the scapular orientation and controlling the uh, uh, arm activities, uh, trapezius and uh, serratus anterior. It was a really, really interesting um, journal um, by uh, Worsi et al. and I think Sarah Motro, the one of the founders uh, of the kinetic control concept. It was uh, an um, amazing one, talking about such activities in the arm race on particular uh, and its outcomes. Also in another uh, paper, Roy et al. reported the motor control training that gives feedback is better that, uh, when it combined when the strength exercises than giving the strength alone. So that's, that's um, uh, a slide to discuss the significance of engaging or highlighting on the motor control or low pace uh, or focusing on moving with different muscle system than just giving resistance to training exercises and how this differ in, in the term of pain management. So I am done to recap how it went. Uh, I started by building a, a relationship with a patient because when it comes to a youth, it's not so easy. So you have to make sure that the youth is accepting you. So you have to be empowering and nice and um, respecting him and his demands. So work on a relationship when it comes to a youth as elite. Number two, I worked on the soft tissue bicep release because it's one of the uh, mobilizers when we talk about the uh, master classification system from the functional point of view, it's mobilizer. So it's not a surprise to come with an overuse injury. So uh, also uh, I, I worked on soft tissue for the other until the forearm and I considered the whole myofascial R9. Uh, I worked on the soft tissue also up till the neck because it's, it's um, a complex of a whole or multiple joints. Uh, we agreed to set the neutral scapula because it's affecting different joints and this is a big girdle. Uh, so we use the taping either uh, with the uh, tendons, with the, with the shoulder girdle or with the pain. So I use the taping for two purposes, either for, okay, either for correction, either for pain management. And we worked on the tendinopathy that was one of the main sources of the problem. And we agreed that loading the tendon is healing the tendon. And finally, we engaged functional exercises uh, composed of uh, tendon loading plus stability training plus uh, chain activation. So this is more or less how, how it went with my patient. So the outcome of my patient is after five sessions, like two weeks, and she was stopped for two weeks. 
uh, after one complete month, she was capable of getting back to her tournaments, playing a, um, um, two complete matches or competitions in in uh, in, uh, in in the first tournament. So that was a big achievement because she was not uh, be able to do so for for two for a big for a big two months for a for a good two one month, two weeks before the therapy and two weeks through the therapy. Um, and that was really good. And let me tell you a secret of a big challenge because after she did, although she did a good match, uh, she did a good job of two uh, complete matches, but she came with a big um, pain. And here, when we needed to do the needling after the cupping and the taping, so it was not an easy job uh, because we needed for this um, stage assurance a lot and soft tissue work a lot not just the correction or the previous goals. So um, that was a, a highlights or a chip set for different uh, phases with my patient. And that's it. This is option for the taping, how I use the taping, not just for the source of pain, how I use it for correction as a long lasting uh, option. So to get back to playing, I, I put it in the uh, shoulder joint and I pull with adjusting the joint and I use another strap to push over the tissues that I need and start to adjust in the direction that I want. So I use it for pain and stability in the same time, or I might use other sort of tape, which is this. It's uh, a McConnell tape because it's rigid and hard. So those are different options of um, my patient management. So, uh, well, long journey. So how to meet me uh, in different countries? I'm, I'm having different activities, either for the cupping therapy, either for one day uh, shoulder training. So uh, in first first week of Pakistan, I'm having dynamic courses in different cities. And then in Dubai in the same month, in mid-June, uh, almost 18 June, I will be carrying on a one-day uh, course of dynamic cupping and shoulder training face-to-face. -face. And then in Cairo, I will be doing also a dynamic cupping therapy course. And in mid-July, I will be doing a one-day um, shoulder training course. So what happened in this face-to-face -face training? We will start by the same examination framework that we reached. We will take different problems rather than the pain and control. We take problem for stiffness, a problem for instability, like uh, history of trauma, dislocation. We take problem referred from the cervical spine, post-operative maybe, a red flag problem. So we start to take with this framework, with how we started, we take different patients, old patient, not, also, not only athlete. So with the same framework, we apply it with different patients, with different problems from this chart and we apply starting by my patient we apply the techniques either soft tissue either the uh, scapular alignment either the chain activation exercise options we apply all it together in the face-to-face -face training and that's it now it's time for questions please and thank you for your attendance questions please So someone raised the hand. May you unmute yourself, Asif, and start to ask your question. Um, may uh, hello. Hi, hi. Um, hi. Nice to see you. Um, it's, it's been a nice, nice presentation. My name is Asif. Uh, I'm a MSK therapist. I've been in who are at uh, cricket sports for the last 17 years. Um, I have three questions. Uh, first is uh, regarding the, the management of the, on the soft, soft tissue. Uh, first is like why there are too much maneuvers for the soft tissue like cupping and then needling and then other soft tissue mobilization. Second, why did you choose the static that uh, static stability over instead of dynamic stability as as the functional movement was the dynamic so why it's not uh, dynamic stability and the third question is 
what will be your algorithm with the case of supraspinatus tendinitis or subacromial impingement in this scenario would you go with the same algorithm good so thank you for your questions okay so let's go, go one by one uh, the first one why i do a lot of soft tissue uh, it depends on the patient irritability for example the, the cupping is is my easiest to, to start with okay so and as you can see my uh, my approach for the cupping was sort of myofascial release rather than trigger point unlike the case for the dry needling the dry needling is deep effect and specific and uh, deeper so you 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 agree with me that and it's totally um, dependent on your clinical judgment your patient irritability factors and your availability of tools actually uh, so it's par partially patient preference and the therapist preference and operational actually sometimes the youth doesn't give me the consent to use needling so that was the only time I used the needling. Why I use the needling? Because I find like point or two resistant. So I want to get rid of them by the needles. My first choice are cups. Why? Because it helps me and it helps the patient and it helps the pain. It's easy. Maybe I use my hands. It's not wrong. Mm. It's not wrong. Um, the cups helps me because it has different options. I may go like massaging. I, I may go just pushing, putting them. I might put them and move. Uh, and, and if you try them, you find that moving with cups is easier than moving alone. So it's totally dependent on your uh, preference practice and your patient. The taping for me, as I told you, is mechanical. I want to help the patient to have like to leave with long lasting effect. So I use it for mechanical purpose that I glide with the tape. Like I do the glide, I ad attach the tape, I pull the tape with doing the glide. So this is my reasoning with using the taping. It's more mechanical uh, than just yeah. pain relief. So for each tool, it helps me for something. This is the first question. I hope that I answered you. Second part is uh, why I did so much. Uh, okay, why I, I use the static stability over dynamic stability? Because two things. When my patient told me uh, I have pain in a specific situation, for me, this is um, stabilizers are two types, segmental, which are stabilizers around the joint and the dynamic stabilizers, which are the global stabilizers. So the static stabilizers are issued, they work in, in anticipation. They need to fire the proprioception. They are concerned with the proprioception, like the key of the car, they need to fire so the movement happens. So when the patient tell me that she has a specific, such a specific problem, I think about the segmental or the local stabilizers, the segmental instability. And this is confirmed with the repetition and the joint malalignment. So in this situation, I think that the global stabilizers are not enough and the problem is super specific. Yeah, that's the point. Yeah, so that's so, why I, so I need to work on segmental instability. So I work it on a static so stability. Can, yeah, I, I got it. Sorry to interrupt you. So we can incorporate, incorporate dynamic stability as well as the static stability. Yes, that's why I, I work it on neutral scapula. I work it on this. And from this, I upgrade to dynamic stabilizers and then with the strength. Mobilizers. Yeah, so we will work on the dynamic stability. Yeah, because exactly. the functional movement is the dynamic stability. So we cannot neglect the dynamic stability as well. That's good. Okay. That's it. So it depends on your reasoning. What do you think? You need to be selective to what to each point. So last part of your question: What will be my approach if there is a subacromial impingement? Uh, my approach will be: I will approach the scapular uh, motor learning. Also, this is, might be goes common in, in my scenario, uh, but I will focus more on the mobilization. When the patient coming loose and uh, uh, has segmental instability, it's totally different from patient having stiffness. 
So you would mobilize until the AC joint. You will mobilize the glenohumeral joint. You will mobilize the scapulothoracic. You will go for passive uh, physiological mobilization to the shoulder. You will go for passive physiological internal and external. You will go for mobilization rather than stability. So this will go different. It will not go with the same algorithm, but I think I think it should because mostly the decomposition. There will be there will be there will be similarities for sure. The mobilization, the, the approach for the scapular motor learning will be common. Because in either way, the, the alignment will be the yeah, same. Motor I mean, learning. Yeah, scapular yeah the motor learning be. part will be will be more or less the same. The rotator cuff activation will be the same. The chain training in the end or the middle to late rehab more or less will be common. You can take some ideas. But in, the goal will be mobilization because subacromial impingement will come to you with a stiffness problem, not with instability or lack of control. But how, how can we, like, for this, like, do you have any, uh, I haven't found any evidence in mobilization in subacromial impingement. In order to increase the space, is there any mobilization? Okay, so, like, well, so the evidence or the, the purpose is not to increase the space. The evidence is to desensitize the joint. And this is a very big difference. And this is very important point of discussion. I don't increase the pain. I do decrease, I don't increase the space. I do decrease the pain. So I give room for the movement and the movement and then give me room for exercise and the exercise improve the alignment and the imply the alignment improves the space. You got it? Yeah, so means it means the scapular setting and the activations of upper and lower trap. So it means the same algorithm will come then. Yeah, yeah. So the so imbalance so itself yeah. will adjust it. Yeah. yeah. But the if there is algorithm. pain, it will inhibit the whole pathway. So here is come the mobilization. It desensitizes the tissues or the joint. Well, uh, Thank you for your answers. For your, Thank uh, you for your question. I just wanted, yeah, Thank you. Wanted to, um, okay, that's good. That's good. I'll give a chance for other people to answer you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. This is the neutral position of the scapula. How can I teach the patient to do so? And please, can you use a photo for illustration? How and when to introduce the functional or chain exercise? On what basis should I begin or rely to make the patient return to sport activity? Why did you consider to ask spine in your assessment? Okay, and how can I screen it? Okay. Okay, thank you for your question and for your interest. So let's start by the last. Okay. So why I consider to ask spine in shoulder uh, examination? Okay, let me ask you a, a question. I will I will um, I will answer in mechanical evidence. The end range of the shoulder uh, comes from the thoracic spine. So to, to do this end range, it comes from the thoracic and not from the shoulder. And this is a mechanical evidence. If this is enough for you to consider the thoracic spine, we, we, we commonly use it. If you want to push the pyramid, okay, you will push it from the tip or from the base. If I want to push a pyramid, I would push it from the tip or from the base. Same applies for the shoulder. If I want to, to get the end range, I push it from here or from here. So that's why we consider, no, not from the tip, from the base actually, because from the tip it will be, it will be so, if this is the pyramid and I, I need to push so much from the tip, but from the base it's easier. So for the shoulder is fine, it's from the thoracic, is easier to get the end range. So uh, from, the, from the base, it's easier to get the end range shoulder. So that's why the thoracic spine is, is needed for the shoulder end range. So for my patient, for my patient is doing this movement. Okay, imagine, imagine a subject go this way. So if this is restricted and I need task to reach, I will go this way. I will force in another um, segment. This is a flow because this is the idea of the spiral line or the chain. It's connective tissue or it's 
there is a flow in another in another uh, segments working together. If I want to do this way and I'm restricted here, so I will force I will force in this way. So that's why when a, when an athlete doing an activity in this way, I have to make sure that the rotation is is easy, because we learn it from uh, Shirley Sherman that the resistance or the movement to go in the easy resistance path. I mean, if I want to go in this way and this is restricted, the, the, the resistance path is easy here. So the movement will go here. So eventually I will get injury. This is the, path, the pathokinematics model. Um, I hope I have answered your third question. So from the mechanical point of view, the shoulder and the, the shoulder and the thoracic are connected and the scapula, it's called the scapulothoracic. So if the scapula is part of the shoulder complex and it's a part of the thoracic spine, so you will consider the thoracic spine for the shoulder problems as simple. So this is a last question. Oh, when I should consider the criteria back to sport, uh, there, there, there is uh, some uh, functional exercises that helps us in different uh, prospects. This, this exercise, for example, is, is one of them. There is for strength and the conditioning, the star like, there is criteria of research for different sports, for different injuries, not to be so long, but um, for me, I break down the problems. Okay, I break down the problems and I consider the motor learning. A and I make sure that the assessment the framework, like if he has active range, I have to got it. I have to got the neurodynamics mobility. I have to go the, the passive range for the different segments around the joints or the tissues. For example, if he has bicep tendinopathy, uh, I have evidence that my patient have to work like six months, even he has no pain. And this is by the way, very important part of patient education. Even he has no pain because this is the, the tendon uh, healing. The healing takes so much time, even if no pain. So it depends on the injury and it depends on the the sports, it's contact sport or it's whatever. So it depends on, on so many things. I have to educate my patient. And the, the blessing of the cognitive motor testing and the training that when you train for the stabilizers the right way, it helps you from the recurrence. So when I, I have pinch marks for the stabilizers efficiency and for, for the coordination testing, when I train the patient for this and I give it as a routine, so I know that the patient will not go into recurrence. The criteria back to sport is dependent on you, on the patient and on the committee he belongs to. So it's more than one thing. Uh, in some injuries and in some, um, there is criteria back to sport. So you, you need to have evidence on, on this. And in other injuries, you, you need to make your criteria according to uh, the patient injury. I hope I have answered your question. So um, in my case, my patient started to get back, but I'm keeping the follow up with the pain and with her commitment to the tendon loading because it takes time, as I told you, and with the functional exercises according to the cognitive motor testing. This could be my criteria for my patient that I demonstrated. How I said the um, neutral scapula, actually this is one of the hardest questions to, to tell in the demo. But let me give you an example. The patient clavicle has to be, the, the neutral scapula is the outward rotation and not the retraction. This is phrased. So the neutral scapula is like the fashion models. I always tell my patients, imagine yourself a fashion model. The fashion model have a V-like, okay, clavicles. So if the clavicle is so flat, this is not a, a, a good sign. If the patient have this, uh, like like the, the photo of my patient. So this is, so his scapula is definitely in malalignment position. So you can know from the level of the clavicle, uh, you can know if uh, the hand is dropped here or dropped here, because if the scapula is the, in the good outward rotation, you will find the arms dropping in the side of the side and not in the front. So those are a couple of signs that give your eyes the alignment that the patient's scapula is good or not. 
if the patient is capable to get out of this, so what I teach my patient, like a fashion model, how they look as if you hang your shoulder, you hang like you, you hang it on, you hang it on, on, a, on a door, you know, you hang your shoulder as if I'm do this, I do this. I get my thumb from front of my thigh to the side of my thigh. So this is what I'm doing. If I'm capable of doing this and adjust it, so my clavicle is seven, so probably I can have a good stabilizer. This is screening. But if I can't, because I have tight pick, I have tight muscles, I have malaligned scapulates migrating from its joint line. So this is, uh, this is abnormal scapula. I hope I have answered your question. Your questions. <laughs> okay. So just give me uh, any sign, like thumb up if it's okay. Uh, hand raise if you still need the clarification. Okay. Does motor control exercise promote alignment and affects performance? Yes, this is sure. Because like my patient, she has a problem in hitting the ball. This is a performance-based problem, actually, because when she do the serve or the swing, it's okay. When she do it with a ball, she suffers. So this means, uh, and by the way, who, whoever was asking about a uh, rotator cuff injury, or I, I'm, I'm not sure, uh, this, my patient rotator cuff is still, okay, you are welcome, my pleasure. Okay, so, my patient, when she asked about hitting the ball, this is a performance based. So when I improve her control, this is definitely a task oriented uh, training. Good. Uh, so this is definitely affects the performance. If I can't twist, if I can't coordinate this with this, so definitely I will not hit in the right time. So the coordination definitely affect the task especially the coordination. So this is definitely will affect the performance because it means the coordination means the timing or the segment do the, the right job in the right time. That my capability to dissociate this and to hit with this. So uh, if for example, I have a lack of coordination in my neck level, it means that I will not see in the right time or in the right pattern. So my performance will be affected. So the answer is definitely yes. Um, so let me check if there is any question before or after. Come to Lebanon. Oh, thank you. I wish I can come. Why not? We had we had activities in Lebanon actually. Uh, or this will be recorded. Yes, inshallah, it will be recorded. Ahmed, inshallah. Uh, what about Dubai, Lebanon? Ah, okay. Uh, people are telling me where, where are um, okay. Uh, by far. By far, I'm spreading in um, Pakistan, Dubai, Egypt, uh, and probably other countries, but not Lebanon in the map. Hopefully, we can come one day. My daughter has the same problem after playing tennis. Okay. So um, if it's so specific, you need to approach her um, stabilizers. Uh, and this appears in the beginning of the match. So if the problem started in the beginning, in the start of the problem, so this is probably local stabilizer, segmental instability, because it's concerned, it's, uh, it works in anticipatory. So uh, the other option that the, the global stabilizers get overloaded because they, they, they don't do their job. So the other tissues uh, are dominated in this instance. So it's so specific actually. So Nice correlation. So someone here raised his hand. May you unmute yourself and start to uh, tell us your question, Dr. Tabish. Hello, Hello uh, Dr. Rasha. Uh, I'm Tabish from Karachi. And I want to ask and I want to correct my concept uh, regarding sports rehabilitation. Uh, uh, you have discussed about a uh, case about uh, squash play, right? Uh, over here in Pakistan, um, we face a lot of patients uh, from cricket sports. And uh, we face uh, patients that used to bat or they used to ball. So uh, 
so if uh, uh, in bowlers uh, they used to ball from right hand and they have a very developed muscle of their back on their shoulder and they came up for, from injuries of shoulder or some back and the, so uh, is there is necessary for us to uh, promote the alignment uh, of their back and shoulder muscles and it affects its uh, uh, performance so is it okay to promote alignment or just to treat this soft tissue injury and what should we do for this i just want to ask um okay thank you for your question um what i got from you and the correct me if i am uh, if i'm mistaken that the uh, your athletes are suffer from uh, the back muscles am i right or the uh, back of the shoulder am i right uh yes uh, mostly shoulder muscles or back muscles uh uh and uh, we saw that they have a, a one side that they use to ball from a that side just like a baseball pitcher they have a hypertrophied muscle right they are well developed as compared to the uh, for, for example they are balling from the right hand so their scapular muscles are very well developed as compared to the left side so and yeah. they came up from the injury so uh, what should be our protocol either we should promote for the alignment and uh, obviously it will affect their performance so how should we deal with them uh, for this in cases Thank okay you. so uh, welcome all right so uh, basically the basic uh, the key stabilizers as i mentioned for the rotator cuff basically so as we you, you will agree with me that the, the upper back is the shoulder muscles so it's it's a component of the back already this is this is a point so the the complex of the shoulder is the rotator cuff this is the first to be approached because sometimes i do external rotation and my patient told me that i do uh, external rotation but actually they are not using the external rotators they are using the iliocostalis and the other overactive back muscles the mobilizers that we don't need we need the stabilizers so if they they don't have proper shoulder stabilizers they will compensate with the trunk so if they they task their task or their their um, uh, activity needs something with the shoulder they can easily throw it on the back so you can imagine that the back is weak it's it's because they don't uh, it's it's overactive because they don't it's not helped with the shoulder okay so what is the solution in this case the solution is to make sure that they are using the rotator cuff uh, as one of the stabilizers just to, to do the rotation in low pace and in a correct way they're working on the rotation cuff on, on low pace and you can you can think it's um, um it's uh, it's easy but it's not so work on low pace for the rotator cuff as an example work on the middle traps like rowing exercise uh so start to approach the serratus anterior uh, uh also uh one like the one i give was the static stabilizers for the rotator cuff like the ball one thing so start to approach the rotator cuff with a very basic thing and you will be surprised that although it's very basic and simple for an athlete how hard he will he will show you to do it so start with the stabilizers around the shoulder joint and then with the scapular girdle like the middle and the lower traps because this is responsible for stabilizing the trunk rotation also. This will be my advice. And then start by the holy chain like the bridges, the glutes because they need the whole support or the stabilizers among the whole spine. This will be my approach uh, for an athlete, not just the stability around segment, but as I told you, the holy chain or stabilizers of different segments because it's all connected when it comes to an athlete. Okay, I got it. So we have to work on stabilizers to prevent overworking of mobilizers. 
stabilizers, right. yes, you have to be selective a little bit, even if he is doing the same exercise, but he will do the same exercise with dominating the different movers. Okay, all right. Yeah. Thank you. Be more selective right. and low pace. Thank you. Best wishes. Okay, so any more questions? Thank you. Thank you, Abir. Thank you, Dr. Abir. Thank you, dear. So uh, again, uh, this is uh, our upcoming activity with Prime Physio in different stations, either Pakistan, either Dubai, either Egypt. Meet me there. Uh, meet us in Prime Physio website, the Rani Physio in Pakistan, Prime Physio Bil Arabi, um, on a weekly basis presenting case scenarios. So if you are from Lebanon, from Sudan, from Egypt, from Arabic speaking country, so be my guest uh, every Sunday. This is exceptionally English uh, speaking uh, session, but we have a weekly uh, Arabic speaking uh, online live. So be our uh, guests. Thank you so much for your attendance, participation, interest, and the question. Thank you for your time. Uh, hope to see you again in our activities and stay safe, everyone.